Okay guys, so getting in debt, we know, is super easy. But getting out? Well, it almost feels like the system is set up so that we don't. And the anxiety that you get from that, the stress of it all, I mean, you can lose sleep over it and it can be absolutely soul crushing. I totally get all of that. I've been there. I know it so well. And I'm here to say that you don't have to go at it alone. There is a way out. Help is available thanks to PDS Debt. PDS Debt has customized options for anybody struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or even medical bills. They truly care about getting you out of debt. PDS rolls all of your monthly payments into one low, interest-free monthly payment. So if you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances are not going down, this program is for you. Everyone with $10,000 or more in eligible debt qualifies and there is no minimum credit score required. Bad and fair credit are both accepted. PDS Debt is a top-rated company on Google and they have an a rating on the Better Business Bureau. So save thousands in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. And PDS Debt is offering a free debt analysis to our viewers. It only takes 30 seconds. So head over to pdsdebt.com com slash 10 to life to get your free debt assessment today. Hey everybody, welcome back to an all new episode of 10 to life with me, your true crime bestie, Annie Elise. I got the blonde hair. I am ready to talk with you about some crazy stuff today. It's going to be a long one. It is going to be a doozy. So let me start by saying this. If you are a returning 10 to lifer, welcome back. Thank you for being a supporter. I'm so happy we're friends and I'm so happy you're here. If you're not a returning 10 to lifer and you've stumbled across this channel by accident and you're like, who the hell is this lady with like the Q-tip looking head? Have no fear. Let me break it down for you. My name is Annie Elise. I like to jump on here, talk with you guys about true crime, specifically deep dive into a case that has been bugging me that I feel like needs to be shared for whatever reason. And we just kind of talk through it like we're friends and hanging out on the couch. I'm on a chair, not a couch, but you get what I mean. So let me start by saying this about today's case. There's a saying, and I'm sure most of you have heard it before, never go into business with your friends. And I think that it's honestly pretty safe to say that that rule also applies to family members too. There's just too much risk that your personal relationship will impact the company. Or even worse, a work problem ends up completely destroying your friendship or rips your family apart. Generally, when you go into business with somebody that you know personally, you've got to assume the worst case scenario is that you're going to have a falling out or you're going to lose some money, something like that. However, you would never expect the arrangement to end in your death, which is exactly what happened in today's story. So guys, let's jump right in. <laughs> Abilene is a quaint little city in the heart of Texas, about three hours west of Dallas. And one of the most prominent people in Abilene was Tom Niblo. And Tom was shot eight times while in bed on December 12th, 2016. Now this was wild because by all accounts, Tom was a very respected and notable real estate agent. He was active in the community. He helped others. He loved his friends, loved animals. In fact, one acquaintance described Tom as a gentle giant. Like when you pictured a good upstanding citizen, Tom was the person who would come to mind. And he spent his whole life in town other than a very brief stint at the University of Texas in Austin. He didn't even graduate as a Longhorn. He came back and he finished his degree at McMurray College in Abilene. Which isn't that surprising if you realize that Tom's family was a pretty big deal around this town. He was descended from bankers, doctors, and really all sorts of other influential figures who made their fortune in this region. And yet, there seems to be zero indication that Tom was nervous about living up to those expectations. I can't even tell if he felt pressure to fill his parents' and his grandparents' shoes, but they definitely had a very long history in this town. 
but instead he apparently graduated from McMurray College and he went into real estate. And he was super successful and became a certified commercial investment member, which is a super elite title that only 1% of all brokers ever get. And when he wasn't selling houses, he worked as a rancher. Because again, he was a very much a Texas boy, through and through. The ranch was owned by his family business, so Tom was making his parents proud and continuing their legacy. On July 6th, 1985, he married a woman named Cheryl K. McKissack. Now, I don't know much about her, where she was from, how she met Tom, because there's basically nothing about her online. Like, zilch, guys. However, it does sound like the two may have known each other in high school. After they got married, Cheryl became a fifth grade teacher, and she and Tom had two daughters, Catherine and Elizabeth. The couple loved to travel, and they really valued their family time as well. Tom chaperoned his daughters at Brownie overnights and also made a point of always coming to their tennis and volleyball matches. And like any good Texas father, Tom taught them how to hunt, shoot, and ride horses. Very Yellowstone-esque. I don't know if people are going to come at me for that, but I love Yellowstone. I just love it. Sorry, I love Rip and I love Kevin Costner. Anyways, I digress. So anyways, Tom's friends said that he was always smiling and just very quick with a joke as well. But that all turned around in 2016, which wasn't the greatest year for the Niblo family. See, on June 9th, Tom's father, Sid, passed away at the age of 80. Now, Tom tried not to let his grief bring him down too far, especially as the year was starting to wind down. See, Tom kind of loved Christmas, and he was really good at decorating gingerbread houses, and ever since his daughters had been little, they liked to help him do this. So then over the weekend of December 10th and 11th in 2016, he had decided to go deer hunting. He got home by Sunday evening, December 11th, and he found his wife Cheryl acting super, super stressed out. It's not clear why exactly, though. She worked as a school teacher, so it might have just been the strain of wrapping everything up before going into the mid-year winter break. Who knows? All I know is that Cheryl went to bed early because she knew that she had a big day ahead of her on the 12th, such a big day that she was going to start her workday before dawn. And since Tom didn't have such an early wake-up call, he decided to stay up a little while before hitting the sack and going to bed. When he did go to bed, Tom closed their bedroom door just like he always did. He and Cheryl had dogs that always spent the night in their room as well, and they always made sure that they were shut inside so that they wouldn't just, like, escape, go wandering through the house at all hours, things like that. Now, unfortunately, Cheryl forgot to set her alarm, so she ended up oversleeping. And when she saw that it was 6.08 a.m., she absolutely jumped up in a panic. She jumped out of the bed, ran to the bathroom with her cell phone in her hand, just a complete frenzy. As near as she could tell, Tom was still asleep, and he was even hooked up to the CPAP machine that he used at night. Cheryl was still in the bathroom taking her morning medication when she then heard the bedroom door pop open. Then, she heard several loud pops ringing throughout the house. These pops were deafening, and Cheryl knew exactly what she was listening to. It was gunshots. Now, luckily, Cheryl didn't panic. She knew that there was somebody dangerous in her room, though, and that running out would just put her life at risk as well. So as quietly as she could, she stepped over to the bathroom door, pushed it closed, and then locked it. Which was an incredibly smart move on her part, because I don't know how logically I would be thinking if I just overheard someone firing a gun in my bedroom right next to me especially if my husband was in that same room. But Cheryl's quick thinking basically saved her life because right after she turned the lock, she heard the knob start to rattle, like somebody was trying to get in. Somebody was trying to turn it. So the good news is her bathroom had two doors. One opened into her bedroom and then one went straight out to the backyard. So she darted the hell outside and just ran to safety. Now as a side note, go Cheryl, absolute hero. But she did make two mistakes here. The first thing is that she forgot her phone in the bathroom, sitting right there on her vanity. Which, honestly, though, I don't blame her for that. I mean, I'm still impressed that she was able to think as calmly and as logically as she did, right? But also because she spent the whole incident shut in the bathroom and she never snuck a peek at the shooter before shutting that door. She never saw them. So she had no idea who was inside her house. 
After she got away, she jumped the wall that ran between her property and her neighbors, and she started pounding on their back door, just relentlessly. When nobody answered, she darted through their gate, out to the street, and then she tried another house. Now, while she was still running around, looking for a safe place to go, she ran into a friend who was out on a walk. He could tell that she was absolutely panicked. Plus, Cheryl was still wearing her very thin pajamas, and she was barefoot, and it was 35 degrees on this day. It was December. It was freezing. So this neighbor, he didn't ask any questions. He just handed his phone over to Cheryl, and that's when Cheryl dialed 911. Now, it took three times to connect, apparently, because the Bluetooth was causing some sort of issue. But when Cheryl finally did speak with the dispatcher, she was sobbing and she was frantic. And it was very difficult for the operator to make out exactly what Cheryl was saying. They just caught these phrases like, I had to leave, an intruder came in, they just started shooting. And also, I just heard so many shots, please help. And who would do that? Who would do that? I don't know what to do. So finally, the dispatcher got Cheryl to explicitly say what had happened that somebody had shot her husband. Which is a little interesting because Cheryl never actually saw Tom get shot. She only heard gunfire. And also, Tom was a very experienced gunman. So as far as Cheryl knew, maybe a home intruder had burst in only for Tom to pick up his firearm and shoot them in return. There were some other odd details about Cheryl's whole story too. Like I mentioned before, she and Tom always slept with their dogs in their bedroom. And I don't know if you've ever been in the room with a dog when a mail carrier or a Grubhub driver walks up, but even the best trained dogs will bark, especially if a stranger is getting too close. But to hear Cheryl tell it, the dogs, they didn't make a peep, not before or after the gunshots went off. So needless to say, there were questions about Cheryl's testimony, and the police dispatched officers to check her house out for themselves. They tried the front door, but it was locked. But they did find the door that opened up to the driveway was open. It let them into the den. So then, the officers, they went inside, clearing the house and confirming that the shooter wasn't still there. Since there were no signs of forced entry, though, they ruled pretty quickly that this had not been a burglary. So they saved the bedroom for last, and right away, before even getting inside, one of the officers picked up the very distinct scent of gunpowder. Then they stepped over the threshold to find 54-year-old Tom Niblo dead from multiple gunshot wounds. He was still connected to his CPAP machine, like he never had the chance to fully wake up. One of his dogs was lying at Tom's side. It was covered in blood, and at first the police thought that the dog was injured, but then later they realized it was just Tom's blood, which had gotten on his little doggy, his loyal dog, his loyal pet. The killer was long gone at this point, but the investigators did find kick marks and a shoe print on the locked bathroom door. It looked like they tried to break through when they realized that Cheryl had barricaded herself inside of there. The officers also found bullet shell casings on the floor and on a chair in the hallway. They were from a 40 caliber handgun. Now, Tom owned one, and he had it in the house, but they eventually determined that he was shot with a different gun, not with his own gun. Otherwise, they didn't find much else in the way of clues. There were no hairs, no fingerprints, no DNA, nothing near the murder scene. They did search the creek that ran behind the Niblo's house, and they did find a machete out there, though. But like everything else on the scene, it also didn't have any fingerprints on it. Then, when they found a blue latex glove in a neighbor's driveway, it confirmed what they must have already suspected. The killer wore gloves to avoid leaving prints. And unfortunately, that glove also didn't have any recoverable DNA on it. From the footprint on the bathroom door, the police knew that the killer wore a men's size 13 shoe. And they found footprints in the mud by a nearby creek. And they were the same size, same size shoe prints, which meant that the killer might have walked up from the waterway to this house. The home's security systems sensors said that the den door opened at 6.06 a.m. and 6.13 a.m., presumably when the killer arrived and also left. 
Tom's autopsy showed that he had been shot eight, yes, eight times. He had been shot in the face, the torso, the arms, and the legs. So whoever killed him didn't leave anything to chance. I mean, they wanted him dead. So next came the witness statements, and police started with the one person who had allegedly heard the murder firsthand, Tom's wife, Cheryl. She was still at her neighbor's house when an officer came to question her. Right away, the investigator noticed that Cheryl wasn't crying. She was very calm, very collected, even though she had just been notified at this point that Tom, her husband, was dead. The officer took Cheryl back home to grab a change of clothes, and then they drove to the station. Now, I've touched on this briefly before, how people will grieve differently, and a person can seem calm after a loss but be emotionally devastated on the inside. So Cheryl's reaction to the murder doesn't automatically mean that she did it. But the police, they still had to do their due diligence. So they swabbed her hands and also her arms for gun residue. And the results came back negative, meaning it didn't look like she had fired anything. The whole time for the tests and even the interrogation afterward, Cheryl was also fully cooperative. She insisted she just wanted to find out who killed her husband. And when she went into questioning, she didn't hold anything back. Not even the details that made her look pretty bad. Cheryl admitted that prior to the murder, her relationship with Tom had been on the rocks. According to her, three years earlier, in 2013, Tom began to develop a pretty bad problem with alcohol. It's unclear how severe it was, and there's no indication that Tom was ever physically abusive to her or even abusive to the kids whenever he was drinking. But whatever was going on with him, it was bad enough for Cheryl to give an ultimatum. He either gets sober or he loses her. Now here's where things get a little bit more taboo and risque, maybe, depending on how vanilla you are. Besides drinking, Cheryl also objected to how much time Tom was spending looking at porn, and she also knew that he liked to cross-dress. Cheryl said that she found women's clothing that wasn't hers, and Tom either admitted what he was doing or she caught him in the act. Now, I do want to make one note before I move on. There's nothing wrong with exploring your gender identity. Certainly not. And there are cis, straight men who do enjoy wearing women's clothing. So I'm not sure if Cheryl mistakenly thought that Tom's cross-dressing meant he was gay or maybe even trans, or maybe it just made her uncomfortable in general. Either way, it was a deal breaker for Cheryl, who kicked Tom out of the house in 2013. He only spent one night alone in a hotel before he promised Cheryl that he would change. There would be no more alcohol, no more porn, and definitely no more drag. He went to rehab and he stayed sober until the day that he died. So from the sound of it, he might have still dressed in women's clothing once or twice. Cheryl described these incidents as like a relapse of sort, like he was some kind of addict. And apparently his sponsor was also keeping tabs on his cross-dressing. Now, even with these quote-unquote relapses, by December of 2016, Tom and Cheryl seemed to be in a much better place. And I do want to pause and say that Cheryl's statement didn't make her come across extremely well. It sounded like she was a bit judgmental about arguably harmless behaviors concerning perhaps depending again on the relationship. And I know I keep hitting on this point again and again, but so often when a person is murdered, the first suspect that the police look at is their partner or their ex. And that's because significant others are responsible for homicides a huge percentage of the time. Add in the fact that Tom and Cheryl had some pretty serious marital difficulties, and it was like Cheryl had this huge flashing sign over her head saying, I have a motive, I have a motive. But the fact that she was so honest might have actually worked in her favor. Would a guilty person actually sit down and talk about all of this past tension, air their dirty laundry? I mean, if she did it, wouldn't you think that she would try to hide some of this? I don't know, maybe out of shame or guilt or whatever it could be. But I guess the police found her story believable because they cleared Cheryl. Afterward, they investigated Tom's business contacts, and they also investigated his daughter's ex-boyfriends. As it turned out, one of the girls had gone through a pretty messy breakup. 
When the detectives went and interviewed her ex, he seemed very shocked and very upset when he heard about Tom's violent death. And he also had an alibi for the day of the murder, which he was able to corroborate. While the police were rounding up suspects and questioning witnesses, they also had to notify Tom's family that he had been killed. They reached his mother pretty easily, and she, in turn, told Tom's sister, Eloise. That left Eloise's husband, 45-year-old Luke Sweester. The police wanted to notify him themselves and also get his statement and just hear what he had to say. That day, he was off picking his kids up from school, so an officer approached him and asked him if he could come down to the station and answer a few questions. But Luke said, and this is a direct quote, No, I do not have an alibi. Then he said he needed a lawyer. Now, I do want to say Luke absolutely had the legal right to ask for an attorney, and a lot of legal experts say that what he did was 100% totally the right move. Sometimes detectives will hone in on the wrong person, and innocent people can and do get badgered into giving these false confessions. I mean, look at what happened to Cheryl. She looked so suspicious before her questioning, but the police still eventually realized that she had nothing to do with Tom's murder. If the investigators were a little less careful, she could have ended up in a really bad situation. So I'm not at all criticizing Luke for standing up for himself and exercising his legal rights. But it is a little odd. As near as I can tell, nobody actually suspected him prior to this conversation. But he was so abrupt and so almost hostile to law enforcement officers, and that kind of puts a question out there. It actually did make them take a closer look at Luke, too, because it just came across like he was hiding something. Again, not proof of guilt by any means, but the sort of thing that makes you have to ask, like, who is this guy anyway? Could he have done something? He was married to Tom's sister, Eloise, and they had two little boys. They all lived in the Texas-Fort Worth area for a while until Eloise came back to Abilene. She came back with the kids, but came back with no Luke. See, they were having marital problems as well, and they were seriously thinking about divorce. Ultimately, they stayed together, though, and Luke moved to Abilene to be with Eloise and the children. Then, by November 2016, so a month before Tom's murder, Luke got a job at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas, where he was oddly enough known as the guy who always showed up on time or early. There was nothing about his background that screamed, hey, Luke is a murderer, or even that he might want Tom dead. But given his knee-jerk refusal to do an interrogation and his request for a lawyer, he was now a pretty big suspect. And it didn't help that his wife Eloise also refused to cooperate with the police, right out of the gate. The detectives secured warrants to search Luke and Eloise's house and also to access their cell phones. So they seized several laptops, PCs, and even some external hard drives. Now, for whatever reason, they had a very difficult time accessing the data on the computer and the drives, but they did get into the phone right away. So they could see everywhere that Luke had been, all thanks to the GPS on the phone. And about a week and a half before the murder, on December 2nd, 2016, his phone showed Luke creeping around Tom and Cheryl's home, including near that den door. Weirdly, though, Tom and Cheryl were off on a vacation, so the house was empty and there was no particular reason for Luke to even be there. The police also discovered that Luke had turned off his cell phone at 7 p.m. the night before the murder and it stayed off until the next morning at around 9 a.m., and that's when he called Eloise about five minutes later. Now, this actually wasn't super out of character for Luke. The detectives could see his records going back three months, and he apparently would turn his phone off for big chunks of time fairly regularly. But when his phone powered up on December 12th, the GPS data showed that he was near a storage facility, one that had been rented by the Niblos. When the police searched that unit, they discovered a bag full of machetes, axes, knives. I mean, that is absolutely creepy, like something out of a straight horror movie. They also found a large safe, and once they lined up all of the appropriate warrants, they cracked that safe open. And 
I'm sure you can imagine what was inside of it. It was full of guns. This was a full arsenal. Basically everything that a killer would need to pull off any number of murders. Except none of the guns in the safe were 40 calibers, meaning that they didn't match the shell casings inside Tom's house. But the officers did find a very mysterious AR-15, which stood out because it had an unusual serial number, which followed a format that law enforcement officers tend to use in their case files. None of that exactly implicated Luke, but it also didn't clear him either. So next, the detectives searched his office. Randomly, one of the officers looked at a list of who else worked inside that building. And that's when they saw a name that they recognized, Randy Wilson. Specifically, Randy Wilson, attorney at law. Now, it wasn't so much that the officer knew Randy personally, but actually Randy had filed a police report about six guns that had been stolen from his office a few months earlier. So on a hunch, the officer had the station fax over the report, and then he matched the AR-15 in Luke's gun safe with one of the weapons that had been reported as stolen. So on December 14th, 2016, two days after Tom's murder, Luke was arrested on gun theft charges. Now that wasn't all that they found at Luke's office. They also spoke with a coworker named Chris Tucker. He told detectives that same detail I mentioned earlier, that Luke always showed up on time or early. But there was one exception. On December 12th, Luke was late, and he didn't come in until around lunchtime. He stepped into his supervisor's office, and Chris didn't know exactly what they said. But afterward, Luke left again for the rest of the day. Now, of course, Luke had already freely admitted that he didn't have an alibi that morning, so it wasn't news that he wasn't at work in the morning. But Tucker did have one other key piece of evidence and information, a possible motive for the murder. According to him, Luke hated Tom because Tom had used a slur against Luke's disabled son. On top of that, he had been constantly fighting with Tom and his family for months, all over how to divide the estate after the death of Tom's father, Sid Niblo. Remember, very prominent family, deep pockets, goes back generations. As I mentioned, the Niblos were incredibly wealthy, and Sid owned a management company that oversaw the ranch, which was said to be worth millions. It also had shares in various banks and buildings and other investments. Sid, his wife Evelyn, Tom, and Eloise were each supposed to have a 25% share of the company. However, after Sid died, the way his will was set up, it gave Tom control of his portion, meaning now Tom ran fully half of the company, which was a huge problem for Luke. He and Eloise were deep in credit card debt, all the way to the tune of about $50,000. They couldn't afford to live, and with Sid's death, Luke was understandably very curious about the inheritance and the family business. But Tom, for his part, found this pretty objectionable. Eloise had never been all that involved with their work, and he apparently didn't feel great about letting her into the family business now. It sounds like he wanted to work with people who wanted to grow and expand their holdings, and not Eloise, who only seemed interested in kind of getting like this quick cash out. Pretty soon, they all began arguing. Eloise refused to sign some of the documents that Tom needed, and then Tom tried to block her from getting into the company's checking account. However, he failed. The whole situation was just messy and very, very ugly. So it should be no surprise that Tom and Eloise were not on good terms by the fall of 2016. And right before Thanksgiving, they had a huge blow-up argument where Tom said, Dad thought you were stupid and crazy and would not have you sign on the accounts. Allegedly, he also called his sister ugly. Pretty rude. Way harsh, Ty. So, clearly he went way over the line and then some. And to Tom's credit, he felt very bad afterward. So, he sent an email apologizing for what he had said. He sent this email on December 9th, three days before his death. In light of all of this, it seemed pretty clear that Luke and Eloise had a pretty clear motive. They disliked Tom personally, and there was potentially a very big payout if he got out of their way. But here's the big problem. All of the evidence against them 
was circumstantial. So weeks and then months passed with no arrests and no big breaks. And when the police finally did get their next big development, their next big clue, it wasn't from a new development. It was something that the detectives and Tom's family had all overlooked earlier. Tom and Eloise's mom, Evelyn, realized that her spare key had gone missing, a key that was also good for Tom's house. I guess they both had the same locks on their front doors, and usually the key was hidden near her front door lamp, and Luke knew exactly where it was supposed to be. See, apparently one time Luke and his son got locked out of Evelyn's house, and they had to break in through the doggy door. Now, Evelyn didn't want a repeat of that incident, so she showed Luke where the spare key was. And for whatever reason, she also told him that it could be used to open Tom and Cheryl's house. Cut to now, and the key was missing. So Evelyn didn't know exactly when it disappeared. It could have been before the murder. It could have been after. All she knew was that it wasn't there anymore. Pretty suspicious. But it does make you wonder... When his cell phone was showing him at that den door weeks before the murder when Tom and his wife were out of town, was that because he was testing the key on that den door? Or was it because he was just casing the scene? Or nothing. Now, like I mentioned before, it took the detectives a while to get all of the digital data on Luke and Eloise's laptops and other computers. They even had to loop in the FBI in order to access everything. But finally, they found an email that was dated December 12th at around 10 a.m., which was just hours after Tom's murder. And it was also before the police had notified Eloise or Luke of his death. The email had the subject, Arrest Insurance, Legal Liability Protection. Like somehow, the couple already knew that they were about to get into legal trouble. And that is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Luke's disturbing internet usage. Now, I'm not going to get into everything because police uncovered quite a bit, but here are some of the highlights. We always say the Google searches will crush you, right? Well, the day before the murder, Luke ran a Google search saying if a member dies... And then there were a bunch of other incriminating searches like Conflict Texas Will and LLC, Death of an LLC Member, Gifting of Real Property Before Death and Estate Taxes, and also Hydrochloric Acid for Dead Bodies. Then, get this, there was this PowerPoint about serial killers and what makes them tick and emails and receipts for knife purchases, machete purposes, and the weirdest detail, to my mind at least, is that the police found an email that Luke wrote after watching The Walking Dead. He said that if he was in the zombie apocalypse, he'd be fine because he had a Glock 23, which is a 40 caliber gun. And finally, there was also a screenshot on Luke's phone that was of the Niblo's house and it had been taken from the Back Creek, that same place that it was suspected that this murderer had entered and approached the house from. And whoever snapped that photo took it two days before Tom's murder. Then there were also these journals that investigators seized from Luke. In them, he wrote about how he was obsessed with money and how he would do anything to get it. On September 17th, 2012, Luke wrote... The last 60 days have been a burning hell. The reality of Eloise and my relationship. I can shut off my empathy system and kill. Serial killer slash psychopaths not only don't care for others, ironically, they don't care for themselves. Been with the wife for 72 hours already and I'm losing my mind. I mean, that's pretty awful, right? Imagine if your husband or partner was writing that about you. It is very, very scary to think about. There were also two undated entries, and they read, everything ends tonight. All debts paid. All accounts closed. Tonight is the end of somebody's world. If it's mine, it's going to be messy. And the second one read, besides, there are worse things than being a killer. Do you want to know the difference between a killer and a murderer? It's where and why you aim the gun. So this was all enough for the police to name Luke as the prime suspect in early 2017. 
And unfortunately, right after that, the investigation ground to a total standstill. In a press conference, Abilene police addressed the murder of 54-year-old Tom Neblo. Thanks for joining us. I'm Adam Shumes. Good evening, I'm Monica Quintero. However, no additional information was given. Our Vanessa Page found out why. It's been seven months since 54-year-old Tom Niblo was shot to death in his home. Still, no arrests have been made for the killing. Abilene police addressed the case in a press conference, saying Niblo's well-known presence in the community makes it difficult. It doesn't make it any more or less important to us but it just makes it more complex. Sergeant Will Ford from the Criminal Investigations Division says the dilemma is still proving the crime. We do not have sufficient evidence uh, to charge anyone with the murder of Mr. Niblo at this time. Ford says no information will be released if it's harmful to their case. It's not wise or prudent for us to release evidentiary information as it could compromise our case. He also took the time to address Luke Sweetser's attorney. Sweetser is the brother-in-law of Niblo. According to Abilene Police, Sweetser was arrested in connection to the murder, but has been released. In response to Mr. Sweetser's attorney, that we have tried Mr. Sweetser in the public media, it should be noted that all of the information, as far as our investigating Luke Sweetser or anyone else as a possible suspect in this case has come through the media, from court documents, that have been legally obtained by the media. However, Ford went on to say the media's use of those court documents harmed the investigation. It would be our preference that not everyone had access to this information. Meanwhile, APD is still considering Niblo's brother, Sweetser, as a suspect in the case and that there are still unknown suspects under investigation. Luke was released from jail and essentially put into legal limbo. I'm not sure why, but it looked like nothing was moving forward on those gun theft charges either. Eloise filed a petition for divorce in April 2017, and Luke moved back to Dallas. Then, in December of 2017, detectives accessed some of Eloise's phone records, which they hadn't been able to get at previously. They learned that in the days leading up to Tom's murder, Eloise actually contacted an ex-convict with a very violent past. I'm not sure who this was, though, because he hasn't been named in the press. But I do know that just a few weeks before the homicide, she made and received many calls from this man numerous times. When the police talked to this guy, he had no idea who Eloise was. He said he had never spoken to her, and he definitely never gave her his number— which I will admit, it's super weird, because if the man was telling the truth, I don't know how to explain those phone records. But the investigators couldn't prove that he was lying, because there absolutely was nothing conclusive there either. So, was it just a cell phone glitch? Something weird in the phone records? Or was maybe Luke using her phone to facilitate this? So the detectives were still, after all of this time, stuck with a lot of circumstantial evidence that pointed like a big red arrow pointing straight at Eloise and Tom. The problem was, though, none of it was concrete. Then, eight freaking months later, on August 9th, 2018, a miracle happened. 12-year-old Hayden Hall was visiting his grandparents at 1201 South Leggett Drive, which was not too far from the old Niblo Ranch. Hayden loved to play in the backyard, which had a creek running right near it. So that day, he went down to the creek. He was looking for, as he puts it, sticks and stuff like that. And at one point, he saw a beach ball. And when he walked toward it, he also spotted something that looked like a toy gun. Spoiler alert, guys, it was not a toy. And when Hayden went to grab his grandfather, he instantly recognized it as a 40 caliber Glock. He immediately called the police. So here's the thing. Hayden found that gun less than 900 feet, yes, 900 feet, from the Niblo's house. For 18 months, the murder weapon had been quite literally in the victim's own backyard. Now, I'm guessing that the investigators missed it because the creek was like super muddy and it flooded fairly regularly also, so the gun was probably buried underwater or even mud during a lot of their searches. But now, they could tell, based on the serial number, that the gun had been legally purchased on August 19th, 2000. And guess who the purchaser was? Luke. 
So it wasn't stolen like the firearms that were in that safe. He had purchased it. But it was harder to show that this was the same gun that killed Tom, because now it was in horrible condition. The barrel had so much rust on it, they couldn't even fire it for a ballistics test. The police called in two separate Glock experts to try and remove the rust and repair it. It took a very long time, but they finally ran their tests, and they got the results on September 4th, 2020. Yes, another two years had passed now at this point. When they compared the casings from the crime scene with the ones from the tests, they were a match, a dead ringer match. That 40 caliber Glock that was found in that creek, registered to Luke, was in fact the gun that murdered Tom. Finally, and oh my god, I really do mean finally because it had been four years at this point, the police finally knew that they had enough. On December 12th, 2016, Thomas Niblo was murdered in his South Abilene home. Tonight, almost four years later, an arrest was made. We have not ever stopped investigating this. According to Abilene Police Chief Stan Standridge, at about 5 p.m. on Thursday, Luke Matthews Switzer was arrested and taken into custody in Dallas for the murder of his brother-in-law, Thomas Niblo. Niblo was shot and killed in his bed in his South Abilene home in 2016. We have probable cause to believe that Luke Switzer is responsible for murdering Tom Niblo. Hence, his arrest today in a $750,000 bond. Chief Standridge says the North Texas Fugitive Task Force made the arrest and the FBI played a major role as well. There was a plethora of electronic evidence that had to be culled through. And when you are dealing with terabytes of electronic information, that takes a considerable amount of time. When asked about the nature of this high profile case and whether or not he believes the case is solved, Standrich said, I don't think a case is technically solved until it is uh, successfully prosecuted. And so we are committed to this investigation all the way through a successful prosecution. According to Chief Standridge, the Niblo family has been notified of the arrest and Switzer will be brought back to Taylor County, but when that will happen is unknown. So on September 17th, 2020, Luke was arrested at his Dallas apartment and he was charged with the first degree murder of Tom Niblo. Neighbors say they never thought an arrest would come nearly four years later. I've just about giving up on anybody having charges pressed. Bruce Reed just doors down from the Niblos remembers that day all too well. Everybody was in disbelief. Walking down the street to find police cars and crime scene tape around his neighbor's home. It was a unbelievable shock to us that Tom was murdered like that. In this neighborhood, you know, there's always little minor theft kids coming along stealing bicycles or breaking into a car, but for something that, like that to happen down the street, it, was, it, it changed the picture. Now throughout the entire investigation, Luke had claimed he was innocent. And in an interview right after his arrest, like hours after he was booked, Luke announced that he was being set up. My attorneys have suggested uh, I do not speak to the media without them present, but I'm willing to make a few statements. Okay. Well, um, I want to know, well, first of all, you know, the obvious question is, uh, did you do it? No. Why, why would you ask me that question? Because, oh, I've been incarcerated after four years as they've been trying to frame me for uh, this murder. Hmm. Maybe that's why you should ask me, did I do it? No, yeah. I did not do it. And it's a shame that our criminal justice system has gotten so bad that not only black lives matter, white lives matter, all lives matter. So you, <clears throat> you are somehow equating this to the Black Lives Matter movement right now? Well, if a Harvard graduate who's a productive member of society can be falsely accused and arrested um, for a murder he didn't commit, um, I'm just happy that I have money to pay counsel because if I was indigent, I'm sure they're going to continue on with this framing. It's ridiculous. So let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. You said after four, how many years after four and a half years you have no, been, it's, um, it's coming up on four years, coming up on four years after four years, you have been charged with the murder of Thomas Niblo, and you said they are, you, you say they're framing you for this. Why do you think that is? Because I'm innocent? 
no, no. Why, 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 do you, why do you think they're trying to frame you? Oh, well, um, I'm sorry. I'm, let me. No, if you're fine. I'm emotional. I'm, I, I completely understand. I understand. Go ahead. Um, it's not every day you get an M16 rifle poked in your eyeball and said, if you move, we'll blow your head off. Um, it has not been disclosed. Um, Chief Stan Standridge is in appropriate relationship with the victim's wife. It has not been disclosed that the victim, the murder victim, my brother-in-law, was a cross-dresser and had an apartment across town where he uh, dressed up as a woman and there are pictures of him on the internet as a woman. Um, I would be looking at those suspects. They did not ask for a copy of my lie detector test when my attorney, uh, Doug Mulder, offered it to them. Um, they have been unwilling to, they sealed the indictment. They won't even give my um, attorneys the quote unquote proof they have. It, this is a travesty. This is an absolute travesty of justice. And I wasn't a social, uh, social justice warrior before, but I sure am now. This has made you into a social justice warrior. Oh, absolutely. There's no justice going on down here in the U.S. Uh, justice system. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Hey, I, real, real, real quick question. Can you go over? That's it. Could this be true? Could he have been framed for all of this? Luke hinted that Tom's wife, Cheryl, might have been having an affair with the chief of police of Abilene, a man named Stan Stanridge. Apparently, rumors to that effect had been flying for a while now. In 2018, Abilene's mayor actually had to make a statement saying that there was zero evidence that Cheryl and Stan Stanridge were involved or that they had anything to do with Tom's murder. So my guess is that Luke was grasping at straws, trying to explain away all of the evidence while avoiding blame for himself. So it's no surprise that he pleaded not guilty during his arraignment, and Luke's trial didn't begin for another two years. Finally, he faced the jury on August 23, 2022. The prosecution's argument was pretty simple. Luke murdered Tom because he and Eloise were hard up for cash. They also were upset that Tom held all of the power over the family's estate. Interestingly, Eloise took the stand against Luke. Their divorce had been finalized in 2021, and she had remarried since then. So now she explained that Luke really wanted to dissolve the family business so that he could get his hands on Tom's ranch. He knew he could sell it for millions, but Tom had blocked Luke's plans. According to Eloise, the night before Tom's murder, she and Luke got into a major blowout fight. Luke stormed out, and at the time, Eloise didn't think much of it. I guess they argued all the time, and he kind of had a habit of taking off, then sleeping at his office, and then returning, and they would make up. But this time, she called Luke at around 3.45 a.m. and left a message when her call went to the voicemail. She finally got a hold of Luke the next morning, a little after 9 a.m. They met up and she told Luke that Tom was dead, and supposedly Luke was completely shocked to hear this news. Now, I'm not sure if that means that he really didn't know that Tom was dead before then, or if Luke was just a, like, really good actor, and at this point it was up to the jury to decide, and they deliberated for 12 hours, only to end up deadlocked. The judge told them, go back, keep discussing the case, and warned them that if they couldn't come to an agreement, he'd have to declare a mistrial. So luckily, this warning, it worked, and they came back with a verdict. We go now to breaking news just into the KRBC newsroom, the moment many have been waiting for. The jury has reached a verdict in the trial for the 2016 murder of Abilene realtor Tom Niblo. KRBC's Noah McKinney is just outside the Taylor County Courthouse. Noah, what can you tell us? Good afternoon. There is a verdict in the Niblo Sweetser murder trial. The verdict is in it is guilty. This jury has found Luke Sweetser guilty in the 2016 murder of his brother-in-law, Abilene realtor Tom Niblo. Now, 
this has been a long time case and as the verdict was read, the family and friends in the courtroom lining the front row just seemed to be relieved, honestly, to have an end to this. Relieved, I'm sure, after this six years of suffering through all of the case building. Now this trial, and especially after earlier when there was talk of a possible mistrial if the jury could not succinctly come to a univer unanimous decision, but apparently they were able to do it, they were able to talk it out and come to that uh, verdict, which again was guilty. Now the jury is going to reconvene, I'm not sure exactly when or what day that is set right now, but they'll reconvene to hear further testimony from witnesses from the prosecution and defense and decide Mr. Sweetser's sentencing, well, what his actual sentence will be. Um, but as far as today is concerned, I just see people leaving, honestly in relief that there is an end to this story. The following day was Luke's sentencing hearing. During it, he once again insisted that he was innocent. He gave this dramatic speech where he talked about how bad he felt for Tom's widow, Cheryl, and how he missed happier times with his family. But this time, the jurors, they were completely unfazed and unmoved. They slapped Luke with a life in prison with the possibility of parole plus a $10,000 fine. After the sentencing, Luke's lawyer gave a statement saying, both families were rather dysfunctional, and probably that's what led to this event. And frankly, he wasn't wrong. Tom wasn't perfect. I mean, nobody is, but that didn't mean that he deserved to die. If not for the murder, he would have been 62 years old, too, at the time of this recording. A very young life. He probably would have still been enjoying his life on the ranch with his family. Instead, all of the Niblos were torn apart. Tom is gone, and his killer, his brother-in-law, is rotting behind bars. Tom's daughters will never see their father again, and Luke's sons will only ever get to talk to their father through a phone from behind a glass partition. It's heartbreaking for everybody involved, and it just goes to show how greed, you know, selfishness, all of these things can literally rip apart a family from the inside out. It is very unnerving to think about, and I gotta say, I can't let Eloise off scot-free. Not saying that she was involved in the planning or any of that, I don't think that she was, but the email had come through, it seemed like maybe early on she knew more than she was letting on, but she was protecting her husband, which I would imagine that's a pretty impossible place to be, your husband and your family and your brother, but I don't know, there's something that just... Mm, doesn't quite sit right with me, but I want to be clear. She has never been charged, convicted, or anything like that. It's strictly a feeling of mine, and again, not to say she was involved. I just feel like maybe she knew more than she let on. But tell me what you think, and maybe I'm way off base here. That's just where my mind is wandering to. In any event, it's just devastating because now these innocent children on both sides of this family have been ripped apart as well. I would imagine there's got to be a divide between the cousins and how they feel about each other and for what? For money? Because they were $50,000 in debt and he wanted to sell the ranch for millions? I mean, I, it never makes sense to me, but I know. It's like the number one reason for spouse murder or family murder. It's greed. It's life insurance. It's money. It's just icky. It just is so gross that people can be driven to such chaotic and devastating and final things just because they want to fill their wallet. You know what I mean? But I get it. Desperate times sometimes call for desperate measures, not excusing it. It's just very hard to wrap my mind around. Like for money, you're murdering for money and you're murdering your family member for money. It's horrible. And you're doing that to your kids. It's horrible. What a long outro, guys. Oh my gosh, sorry. I just kind of went on a full-blown tangent there. Anyways, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of 10 to Life with me, Annie Elise. Again, if you are brand new, this was the very first video. Let me know in the comments. I want to know if you're a first timer. And if you want to make sure that you check out future videos of mine and cases, make sure to hit that subscribe button. It's totally free. It's totally free. It just will let you know next time you log into YouTube if I've posted a new case. And for all of my returning 10 to lifers, thank you so much for your support, for being here today, and for everybody watching, new or old, whatever you are. If you want access to uncensored cases, go check out the podcast Seriously. It's totally free. It's on all podcast platforms, whether it's Apple, Spotify, iHeart, wherever you listen to your podcasts. But the thing is, 
YouTube likes to censor a lot of things. They flag a lot of what I try to put out and they really want to dilute a lot of the words and things that you say. Whereas on a podcast, you're free to just speak openly and describe what actually happened and use legal terminology, which I don't understand why YouTube flags it. It is legal terminology in open court, in records, whatever. I could go on all day about it. But anyways, on the podcast, I'm able to talk about these cases more freely. So it's uncensored. So if you haven't checked out the podcast yet, I highly recommend doing so. Not only are they uncensored and full comprehensive case deep dives, but also you get access to cases that I don't have over here on YouTube, some audio exclusives over there. So check it out. I also will link it in the description, but it is called Serialistly and you can find it on all podcast platforms. And again, it's totally, totally free. All right, guys, thank you again. Longest outro of my life, but I enjoyed talking with you guys today and I will be back with another true crime case for you very, very soon. All right, until the next one, stay safe. Bye.